want to do is I want to take a step back and, and get back to our Western world first so uh, we can put everything in context because it's very interesting to see uh, all that and say, okay, this is incredible, but what do we have to do with me? How can we help me? So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm bringing an analogy from a totally different uh, field, which is uh, I'm taking the framework from uh, a professor of MIT called uh, Otto Scharmer. He does uh, leadership workshops for, uh, for leaders, uh, especially for uh, people in corporations. Now, we're going to say, what does it have to do with healing? Uh, he did an experiment uh, with a company that we're going to just call here Global Health Company. It was one of the biggest in the industry, a European company. And they were having problems with uh, managing the company properly. And one manager said, uh, the company suffers from a virus. And the virus is the legacy of its history. So even the new people that arrive into the company, and, and if they uh, hire new uh, leaders, they're going to catch the virus. So wh what is that virus? All chances of success are blocked by downloading behavioral patterns. So we are carrying this, uh, this legacy with us, the behavioral patterns that we learn, that we're conditioned, uh, to, the, the way that we learn to see the world and to relate to the world. It's embedded in organizational culture. It's a powerful mechanism for reproducing the patterns of the past. So I'm bringing this just to, to, uh, for us to make the analogy for, uh, into our personal lives, how we are embedded in, in this powerful mechanism that drives our thoughts and the way that we approach things such as uh, psychedelics. They, uh, he also did a very interesting uh, exercise. It was a patient uh, physician dialogue forum where they run uh, interviews with uh, 100 patients in order to learn how they experience health and sickness in their lives and with their uh, 35 physicians. And after uh, their findings, uh, they got together. It, uh, it lasted for a couple of months, this experiment. And 95% uh, of the participants experienced the focus of the, cur uh, the current health system as mechanical re-engineering. And the same 95% expressed their wishes for dealing with health issues through development, self-transformation, and inner growth. Now, uh, I'm going to bring you to this table here. So when you talk about mechanical re-engineering, we can see this iceberg that we represent uh, you know, the whole self, the, 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 the self with the capital S. And there is an event here. Usually, there is the first level, which is the mechanical level. We see the body as a broken part. We have a defect. And the function of the doctor is to repair this problem that we have. We usually see this happening in emergency uh, situations when they have to go uh, to the intensive care unit or you've broken your arm or something like that. Then there's a deeper level. This level is about uh, behavior patterns. So you go to the doctor, you go to our therapist and you say that you're feeling ill, you're not good and uh, you just don't want to be fixed with uh, medication, you want to do something. And the doctor is going to act as an instructor. He's going to try to uh, show you how to engage into a different behavior. You were smoking too much, you're not having a good diet, or you're too stressed because you're overworking. But there's an even deeper level than that. And in that level, let me go back here, it's a level of thought. That's our assumptions. So why do you work so much that you get stressed? Because you have certain assumptions about work and family, that made you uh, give preference to one or another. And in that level, the doctor is going to act as a coach. So he's going to try to teach you how to get out of these behavioral patterns through changing uh, your assumptions. And finally, we get to what uh, Sharper calls the self-transforming presence. And in this process, the doctor acts as a midwife. And here is the analogy with the ayahuasca ceremony. I'm going to talk about uh, I think it applies in general for all uh, plant medicine, but uh, we're talking in the context of ayahuasca here. And this is the deeper layer of the cell. And that's uh, when you see that uh, I was talking about pain and how we try to suppress or avoid pain. And in this process, uh, pain is something that uh, is, is bringing you a message and uh, it's an opportunity for you to go to this process of death and rebirth. So, to shift from this downloading of behavioral patterns 
from seeing, which is the process that the, the midwife is going to uh, make you go through, we have to understand that perception is not passive, but it's an activity that the body enacts. So this is very important because now we're talking about the body here. And that's the distinction that she made before, and I totally out second that. Uh, I don't think ayahuasca is a psychedelic. It shouldn't be called like that. There's a big difference between uh, psychedelics, and uh, I wouldn't even call it an entheogen, which some people call. And I'll later show you that uh, I have, uh, I'm the founder of a nonprofit organization in Brazil, and we decided to borrow a terminology that was uh, coined by a professor at Penn State, a very, very interesting person. Richard Doyle, and he, he came up with this term that, uh, to call them uh, ecodelics. So psychedelic would be manifesting the mind, but when you think about manifesting the mind, you are still entrapped by uh, the mind. So that's what you're saying. You know, your mind are, is playing tricks on you, and you think that all processes are happening in the mind sphere. When you talk about entheogens, you're saying uh, that entheogens are uh, manifesting the divine within. But that uh, is a very uh, risky way of approaching it because it can reinforce uh, some kind of narcissism of trying to transcend yourself. And uh, that's what Ken Wilber uh, calls the divine egoism. And uh, so what ayahuasca does, and if anyone has been to an ayahuasca ceremony, you know that. It acts in your body, not in your mind. So the plant medicine, it primarily works in the body. And what it does, it, it, it scans all your body and, and it does the cleansing, which is pretty much setting free all of uh, you know, your parts and your molecules from the grip of the mind. And the purging, we go back to the modern medicine and we understand that if somebody is vomiting or having diarrhea, this person is sick, that's a sign, that's a symptom of illness. In ayahuasca process, it's the opposite. We say hush, hush when somebody is, is purging in the ceremony because that's where, when the process really is starting to happen. You are getting rid of all these toxins, be them physical, emotional, or spiritual. What it really does is it's cleansing the body from the grip of the mind. So your body can become sensitive to the feel. A great analogy would be entering a house full of clutter and all kinds of trash and furniture and trying to put or create something new there and so ayahuasca cleaning everything so that there's space inside that you can manifest something new yeah so it's, uh, it's very important because sometimes we think of uh, psychedelics and we may think of LSD and uh, you know and it's very easy to make an analogy that LSD is some kind of uh, magic drop you know a magic pill which is the same that, uh, you know, we want the doctor to give us that pill, the magic pill that's going to solve our problems. And plant medicine doesn't work like that. It's going to break you down. It's going to give you a tremendous beat up. So you become vulnerable to finally be able to sense and to see, not with your mind, but with your heart. And that, that's the most important thing that happens during an ayahuasca ceremony. It shifts the perception from the mind to the heart, and we realize that we have another uh, organ of sense perception, which is the heart. And if any one of you is, uh, is acquainted with the work of uh, Rudolf Steiner, you know that uh, spiritual science is all about that. It's about uh, trying to understand the world through the heart and not through the mind. That's very interesting, the second the sentence here. It's not that we don't know enough about the brain or about biology. Again, we're in the mind sphere here. But we don't know enough about experience. And ayahuasca takes us deep into an experiential process where we can really feel everything. And this deeper place of stillness that we need, you know, in order not to be uh, controlled by uh, thoughts, but what our mind is saying to us, is immersion in concrete particulars. We cannot leave the cave that we are, you know, the, the Plato's cave. We are only seeing the shadows being projected in the walls. We cannot leave that cave by just downloading abstract thought. So this is kind of a paradox because I'm here in an academic institution and what we learn here is how to download more and more and more abstract <coughs> thought. What ayahuasca does, it, it breaks it all down by working in our bodies and opening all other organs and senses of perception to really be in the field and see what's happening. 
So the patient landscape of listening, again, that's Charmer's uh, framework. I'm talking about an MIT professor that's teaching a leadership course. It's really fascinating that he got into this. The patient in, in that uh, experiment that I was talking about previously, for the patient landscape of listening to really uh, uh, blossoms, there are these four steps that, that have to happen. And they are precisely the four steps that happen during an ayahuasca ceremony. So the first one is crystallizing tension. That's when you articulate purpose and you begin to look at a problem. So you say you want to participate in a ceremony and you start feeling afraid. Oh my God, I don't want to purge. What's going to happen? What if I lose my mind? What if I get controlled by this evil alien uh, entity that wants to destroy me? Or whatever it is that you're afraid of. You're thinking about it. You're giving it a thought. You're concerned with what's happening to you. Before the ceremony happens, you're crystallizing your intention. I want to go through something. I want something to happen. A transformative event. And you begin to look at a problem. Second thing, you move into context. That's when the interviews happen. She's going to do ceremony. She's going to interview everybody prior to the ceremony. She wants to know more about you. What are your habits? What are uh, the history of your diseases? What happens to you? Who, where are you coming from? You're moving into context. And when you get into the ceremonial space, you're going to meet everybody there. You're not taking ayahuasca by yourself like we do psychedelics. That's very important. You are in a healing sacred space and you're connecting to people. And everybody's going to look at everybody else's eyes and acknowledge, okay, you are here. You like me, we are looking for something. And you have the opportunity to exercise connection and care with the people that are there and you you find within that sphere um, the things that make you commonly human those things that all humanity shares whether it's in suffering or in fear or exactly. joy yeah and a lot of a lot, a, lot, a lot of stuff is going to come up i was just thinking about it writing anticipation decision choice anxiety fear horror clarity purpose autonomy you have to make choices you, you have, this is coming from inside, you want to participate in that, and you want to go through a transformation. And that means charging the container. You are there, you are waiting for the ceremony, Bunny is going to paint everybody, you're preparing and charging the container that is going to hold that ceremony, and everybody's going to go through that together. Finally, we get to number three, which is the ceremony itself. That's when you suspend judgment and you connect wonder. And the plan does all the work. We have also the Western idea that ayahuasca is, uh, it consists, I, I think pretty much all of you or maybe most of you know, uh, know that ayahuasca is a mixture of two different plants. One of them contains DMT, which is this molecule that uh, most living beings have and we, we have it in our brains and your uh, circulatory system. And DMT is highly, highly uh, hallucinogenic. And the Western uh, approach to ayahuasca is almost only through DMT. There's this documentary called The Spirit Molecule. So we are only thinking about uh, what happens to our mind when it ingests DMT and we go through these different dimensions. But here we're talking about something totally different. It's about uh, breaking our boundaries in our bodies and allowing us to connect with other people. So it's not about smoking uh, DMT, like she was saying, or uh, I've been in the forest many times, and once I went to a retreat, and Dennis McKenna was there. And then later he told me that somebody uh, offered him uh, what he was calling pharma wasca. It was an attempt to reduce ayahuasca to a pill that would uh, apparently uh, solve the problem of uh, feeling sick. That it, it would get rid of nausea, and you would just have the good effects of the psychedelic effects. Again, that's destroying ayahuasca. It has, uh, it's totally opposite to what we are talking about here during this whole workshop. We, uh, nausea is not a bad thing. Cleansing is not a symptom of illness in this case, but cleansing is the necessary thing that we have to go through in order to get uh, rid of the grip of the mind. So finally, after you suspend your judgment and connect you wonder, there's perhaps this is the most important part of the ceremony. It's the integration process. It's what uh, brought uh, Erie to existence, to deal with this. Because we can't just do a ceremony and, you know, just say bye-bye. Or, you know, just take ayahuasca alone and say, okay, I got it. The most important part happens in sharing. That's after you suspend your judgment and you're no more driven by your mind and coming to connect with people through your opinions. 
that you are able to enter the space of seeing and thinking together. And then you understand that uh, after the cleansing, after the whole process, that you can sense from the field. Not from your mind, but from the field. And everybody's thinking together. So it's a very, very beautiful thing that happens, the sharing circle. That's when you start seeing each other for who they are and you identify with themselves. Everybody, when they give their testimonies, you can see something there that blossoms a flower in your heart because he's just like me. You know, it's, it's really beautiful. It makes me very emotional to talk about this. I put this uh, painting by Frida Kahlo, which I think is an amazing painting. She shows the whole thing, you know, integration between dark and light and suffering and, and being in the earth. All the plants, all this earth quality and this mother quality of taking care. That's pretty much the ayahuasca real. And then we're going to say, did Frida Kahlo take ayahuasca? I don't think so. But everybody knows that she went to deep suffering. And she was able to break down the barriers of her, her mind and sense with her whole body and be here in this planet, right here, right now. We have, like I said, we have uh, this uh, non-profit organization called Plantano Consciencia. Plantano Consciencia uh, means uh, something like uh, planting or seeding consciousness. But it's uh, the fun thing in Portuguese, the really interesting thing is that uh, we, I paired up, my brother is a neuroscientist, and I paired, we paired up a bunch of scientists in Brazil, and since ayahuasca is not illegal there, it's easier to do research. And we all know that uh, the best way for uh, these this issues to be accepted in the Western world is through science, because science is really like the, the last world, you know, the, the big game in town. So, plantando consciência in, port in Portuguese uh, means also plantando com ciência, which would be planting with science. So, uh, I invite you all, I encourage you to go visit our website. We have like some flyers outside that you can take <coughs> the link for our website. I'm also directing a documentary called Medicina, and I'm going to approach these issues that I'm talking about here. Uh, I have done many interviews, and uh, right now I'm searching for funding. And we're going to talk about these issues, like I said before, not psychedelics, not entheogens, but uh, ecodelics would be a way of approaching it. But I, like, I myself, I'm not a scientist. Um, uh, I belong to this uh, non-profit organization, but my personal approach to that is the ceremonial, shamanic <coughs> approach, which sees them as plant medicine. Again, the facilitator. The healer, that's very important as well. I, I, I didn't mention that before. But during the ceremony, why do we need the shaman there? What's the role of the shaman? He's singing, he's dancing, he's blowing, and he's moving the whole group through the, this collective field shift. So we can all sense from the field. And keeping us from downloading uh, you know, the behavioral pat patterns that we all have. So that's why if you are in ceremony, usually it happens in the dark or very dim light. And uh, we are not encouraged to engage into conversation during the ceremonies. It's a process that uh, the healer has uh, you know, this role of taking care that the ceremonial space. If I said, if I mentioned before the charging the container, the ceremony is holding the container together for the healing to happen. And then we redirect attention from object to source. We're no longer looking at each uh, other people or whatever it is as object from a subjective perspective, but we are connecting directly to the source. It's really uh, it's amazing. It's like being a kid. You know, when you are going through the ayahuasca process, you really can understand what children do, how they act. They are open like that. They don't have their minds taking a grip on, on whatever they do. They are just sensing from the field. And so those, we, can, we could say that we become kind of children. And therefore, we are participating in the phenomenon, with everything that's happening there together. Again, this is very important. You're not on your own. You're not alone. You're not journeying on yourself and you know, taking a trip into your own mind. But you're doing it together, a bunch of people. And everybody's participating into this coming into being of the process of healing. Uh, Plantando Consciência, I already mentioned. 
and I don't want to extend further because everybody's tired, so thank you very much.